There was um, at one point a, uh, a first grade teacher, and uh, she had taken her class to lunch, and uh, after lunch, the class came back, and she wanted to just check their knowledge of like some common proverbs or things that people say to kind of help us get along with life. And, uh, and so she, uh, she asked this question to the class. She said, what comes next? Cleanliness is next to what? Little boy there after lunch, he had on a white shirt and he had a big ketchup stain on his shirt there on the left side right next to his heart. And he was really excited because he knew he had the answer and he raised his hand. He said, cleanliness is next to impossible. And I think if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, we really would believe that as well. We're going to talk about cleanliness a little bit this morning, but we're going to be talking about reconciliation. And looking at Colossians chapter 1 and continuing what we've been doing, we've said that last year we said that Jesus was many things. And one thing he is at the very end, he's a reconciler. He brings us back into our relationship with God. A relationship that we damage with sin and uh, living the way that we live because of our selfishness. It's hard to be clean and we can feel that because our sin can be so strong in our lives. We can fight it and then it comes back. And we just feel like, man, I'm not, I'm not clean. How can I be clean? We talked about last week how Jesus has reconciled us through his blood. Yeah. And clean, cleanliness is important, but how does that work? We're going to be looking today at um, Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Come on, JC. It's going to be looking at verses 20 through 23. Amen. The title of the sermon is Reconciled to Riches. Come on. Reconciled to riches. And we're going to look at four key elements of reconciliation for the Colossians, but also they apply to us. The four elements of reconciliation that we see here in Colossians chapter 1 that Paul speaks about to the Colossians are number one, alienation. Mm -hmm. Number two, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Number three, continuation. And number four, glorification. And with all these we are reconciled to riches. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. The Bible says there, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Not the most encouraging verse in the world, right? Yeah. As Paul speaks to the Colossians, he's told them how thankful he is for them, how they're awesome, they've been Spreading, they've been spreading the word and bearing fruit all over the world, and people know about them and know about their faith and know about their love for the saints. And, and he's told them about the supremacy of Jesus and how awesome Jesus is that they need to remember. And all of that is hinging here for the Colossians how much God thinks of them, how great Jesus is, how he longed to reconcile them. And then now it gets really personal. <clears throat> Paul says to them, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. Evil behavior, that's talking about sin. You know, and sin is not just bad things that we do. It's also the good things we know we should do and don't do it. That's also evil. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And so Paul has made it personal for them. This idea of alienation. Now, this can get kind of heavy. To be an alien and an enemy of God, who wants to talk about that on a Sunday morning? Right. This is your day off, right? We need to have some levity. Well, here's some levity for you. Peanuts. Little, little Peanuts comic here. This is, uh, of course, Lucy and, and Snoopy. I say, of course. I know some people have never read newspapers now. Yeah, and so there much. used to be a thing called newspapers, right. and they would have a comic section, and Peanuts is one of the most popular comics comic strips of all time. Not a comic like X-Men or the Avengers or any of that stuff. A different, it's still illustrated, but it was just a little strip that came out every, mm -hmm. every week. And so this is a comic here with uh, Lucy and, uh, and Snoopy. And, uh, and this one, uh, you know, you got Lucy here and she says, you know, uh, there's times when you really bug me. But there's also times when I feel like giving you a big hug. And she gives him a hug and Snoopy kind of thinks to himself, that's the way I am. Buggable and huggable. <laughs> if you're married, both of you are buggable and huggable. <laughs> you both need reconciliation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's always so good. Wow. 
God is good. <laughs> we all have our huggable days. I'm huggable today because I was a little bit sick yesterday, so it makes you feel a little bit more pity. And so I would, it loves me. You, love, you love your spouse a little bit more when they're not feeling well, unless you're super selfish, and that's terrible. When, you're, when your spouse is not well, you need to be lovable. You need to be huggable with them. It needs your, it needs your love. But did you ever alienate anyone with your buggableness? Or have you ever been alienated because of your buggableness? We all have our huggable days, but we might have more buggable days. Do you ever alienate people? Have you ever been alienated? What, what does that mean? You know, someone who is, is buggable, they just annoy you to no end. And if they annoy you, what do you want to do? You want to ignore them. If someone's annoying, you want to ignore them. You want them to be away from you. And sometimes we can be so annoying to people that we feel alienated. We're put off to the side by ourselves. Some things that bug me, just, just for, if, if you want to bug me and... My kids usually start taking notes when I say, if you want to bug me, because they like to see which button they can, they can get to. And I, I've learned over time as a dad that you tell them what bugs you, they do it, and you just kind of, I only have to ignore it for five minutes, and then it goes away. I can also ignore it for ten minutes, just so you know. So, <laughs> one, of, one of the chief things, and there's actually a clinical term for it that I read recently, but I didn't look it up, is if, if I'm sitting there watching a movie or something, and someone's sitting next to me, and they've had a soda, and they start chomping that their ice. That makes things in my neck just want to attach to the top of my head. I mean, it's like <laughs> automatic stress. But it doesn't just have to be ice. It can be potato chips. If you're eating potato chips, and I'm not, and I hear that crunching sound, it just right in my shoulders, it just starts wanting to go up like that. Or yes. cereal. Yes. If everyone's having cereal at the table, and I'm having uh, coffee and a piece of toast, but the toast is not crunchy. If, if I hear crunchy sounds near me and I'm not crunching along, man, that annoys me. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. Thank you. It's, it's, I'm always glad to know it's not just me. No. And what I want to do is I want to go and sit as far away from that person as I can. Now, I, I'm not the one who's being... I'm kind of being alienated, but if everyone else is annoyed by their chomping, that person is going to end up sitting there by themselves. And they're going to feel kind of alone and ostracized. You know, that's kind of a, a, a personal buggable thing for me, something that annoys me, but there's, there's universal ones. People who don't brush their teeth and want to talk right really close to you. <laughs> now, I can say that that that's just people with poor hygiene, but if I have a cup of coffee and then want to go and speak to my wife about something important, she might ask me, honey, would you like a mint? <laughs> so anytime I'm asked if I want a mint, I automatically assume my breath stinks and say yes. If someone offers you a mint, just say yes. Yeah. If someone offers you a mint first thing in the morning, you should have brushed your teeth, all right? Because it's, it's kind of after that. Amen. Those kind, I've, always taught, I've always taught my kids... Two things you have to do before you leave my house or before people get there. You gotta brush your teeth and you gotta put on deodorant. Yes. Guys, that's just a general we do not live in Europe. Now if you go to Europe, <laughs> the social norms might change. That won't bug anybody. I, I've lived in Europe for a number of years. There are some there are some scents that you would get on public transportation that you just would not expect to have in America. And so if you if you stink, for lack of a better word, there's a good chance that you're going to feel alienated. But it's not, it's not them, it's you. It's not them, it's you. Selfishly, we can always think, well, you know, what's wrong with them? It's not them, it's you. Because we don't want to adapt to some social norm. We're happy to be alienated, but we're actually kind of sad, or else we wouldn't care about them. No one wants to be alone. No one wants to be alone. No one wants to feel like they're not loved. You know, if you're at school and you see someone sitting by themselves, I'd encourage you to go talk to them. They're yeah. feeling alienated. Yeah. Yeah. They need to feel loved. That's how God is with us. We were once alienated from God. We were enemies in our minds because of 
our evil behavior. It but God. God is holy and righteous and perfect. And we are so imperfect and continue in our imperfection. And so God wouldn't have anything to do with us. A lot of times people can feel like, well, that's not the God that I've heard about. God just loves everyone all the time. That's absolutely true. He loves you, but he won't have anything to do with you if you decide that you love your evil behavior more than you love him. How do we know that? Well, the Bible teaches us that. In Colossians uh, chapter 121, we see that. We're, we're, we're separated from God. We're actually enemies of God because of sin. We also see in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Hey, God loves you. He's able to save whoever he wants to save. He's able to save everybody and anybody. Yeah. Nor is his ear too dull to hear. Hey, hey God, God is able to hear everything that you're saying. Yeah. But it says in Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities, your sins, your evil behavior have separated you from your God. Yeah. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not here. It's no fun being alienated from God. Not just alienated, but his enemies. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, as for you, this is Paul talking to Ephesus, but it applied to Colossians. Same idea. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions, that's sins. And, and verse 2, and it says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's talking about Satan. The spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us, like he's not saying, hey, you're bad. He's saying all of us, every single person uh, lived among them at one time. We all did the same thing. We were all evil. We were all separated from God. We gratified the cravings of our sinful nature. We wanted to do whatever we wanted to do regardless of how God felt about it. And we followed its thoughts and its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, just like everyone else, we were... It says in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we were, ob we were by nature objects of God's wrath. Mm. So we made ourselves the objects of God's punishment. We became his enemy. Something in, that we, he couldn't love, but that was bound to be destroyed. You know, it's one thing for us to annoy others and to feel unwanted. It's another thing to be alienated from God. Right. To become God's enemy. No one, I think, ever plans to be alienated from an enemy of God. People who are not going to church today are not out there thinking, Hey, you know what I think I'm going to do today? I think I'm, I don't know if there's a God or not, but if there is, I think I'm going to be his enemy. Right. I'm going to fight. That is not a rational conversation that someone has with themselves in their head. Yeah. Right. Maybe one or two people, but not most people. Right. <laughs> If there is a God, I'm going to fight him. If there's bad, if there's wrong to be done that God thinks it's wrong, I'm going to do that. If there's right to be done and God likes that, I'm never going to do that. That's not the way we think. We think, you know, if I don't go to church, if I don't do this, life is just busy. You know, I'm busy. I don't have time. I'm busy with this. I got to focus on this. I got to make this my priority. And so we go out there and we live this life to become as successful in this life as we can, whatever success means. And we think, I'm, I don't, God's probably not, I'm not mad at God. I'm just not going to church and I'm not going to devote my, myself to something uh, that, that is just churchy. I, I don't hate God. But the Bible also teaches that not loving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength sure does get us closer and closer to hate. It says in James chapter 4, verse 4, James says to a bunch of Christians, so he's telling, Chris, he, say, he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? If you try to be successful in this life, and that is your driving force, your education, your job, your relationship with that boy or that girl, or not work, or pleasure, or entertainment. If that is your driving force, and you love that more than you love doing whatever it is that you can do for God, whether it's staying away from sin or doing all the good you can do, that's hatred toward God. Friends, the closer friend you are to the world, the more you hate God. The less you love God, the more you hate God. That's just the way the Bible lays it out. It's not like, 
hey, I'm probably okay, or I'll maybe try church later, or I'll, I'll look into that later. No, no. You hate God. You're alienated. You're an enemy. Paul said, uh, James says to the Christians, you also are becoming enemies of God. And so it's not like everybody that goes, goes to church is okay. Mm. It, it, even if you, if you go to church, you become a Christian, and you start loving the world again, James says, don't you know that that's hatred towards God? Hatred towards God. He goes on to say, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. If you make more time for things in the world, whether it's work or relationship or entertainment or physical fitness, you, you could just make them. If you make more time for those things than you do for the things of God, you become an enemy of God. And so people who don't go to church, even though they don't think they're enemies of God, they're enemies of God. They hate God. People who do go to church, if church is where your relationship with God ends, and the rest of the time is work and entertainment and fitness and uh, go down the list, and God's not number one every single day, all the time, we're closer and closer to becoming enemies of God all over again. That's why James writes it to Christians. That's right. Yeah. Because we all were alienated. That's right. And it's like gravity. We get drawn back into that life That's right. of being an see. enemy of God. The Colossians were just like us. All, all of us, it says at one time, were alienated from God. We were enemies of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can slide right back into that by our evil behavior, our, our godlessness, our selfishness, our indulgence. And because of that, we were isolated. The word alienate means to isolate or, or to estrange, to be, to be put aside on your own. That's where we were. And the very first step in reconciliation is to take responsibility for what you have. Right. That's the very first step. If you say, I, I, I haven't done anything wrong, everyone else has, you will never reconcile. Because everyone else will be thinking the exact same thing. I didn't. No, you did it. If you take responsibility for what's yours, you can help with alienation. You just stop chomping the ice. And say, well, if you don't like ice, I won't chomp it around you. I'll just chomp it when other people are around who like the... Be an ice chomper with the other ice choppers. Stay away from me. Right? If you're someone who doesn't like to brush your teeth and doesn't like to wear deodorant, just say, I, I, don't, I, don't, I say, kids, I, I don't care what you do when you're home on the weekend. Brush your teeth or not, I'll just keep you deodorant or not. That's fine. I, I still, I'm your daddy. I have to love you. <laughs> Stay away from people. You won't be. And then when you're with people, brush your teeth and put on deodorant. That's the point of that, by the way. I don't think everyone has to brush. I, I'm not that hygienical. I'm not a Nazi there. But everyone else, if you want other people to to love you there, then you got to brush your teeth and put on deodorant. I'm gonna love you no matter what. But some people just choose to be alienated. I just, I just won't stop. And if we choose that, whether we're not Christians or aren't Christians, if we choose to be alienated and enemies of God, no one can stop you from being that. But you won't be reconciled. We were all once there. We can all get there again. We have to take responsibility for what's ours. Point number two, reconciliation. So we have to recognize we're alienated, mm -hmm. but then there's actual reconciliation. The actual reconciliation piece. What is that? Well, in verse 22, Paul says, hey, you were, you were like this. You were smelly, ice-chomping, chip-eating, annoying people to God. Uh, uh. Verse 22 says, but now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, Jesus' death and yours, by the way, to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. The next step in reconciliation is the actual reconciliation piece. It means, and as Christians, we hope and pray that as many people as, as possible be reconciled, brought back into a loving, friendly relationship with God. Not that God doesn't love them, but that they will take responsibility for their alienation and be able to love God again, but only through Christ's death. Mm -hmm. Only through Christ's death. He's the only one that makes reconciliation possible. Right. God has given the plan, and Jesus has set the plan in stone and written it, uh, his name in blood. 
you know, the interesting thing that is that as Christians, we can say, oh yes, I know that everyone as a everyone is Christian, everyone in America, everyone in the world who knows about Christianity knows something that Jesus died. Like that's a thing. Like, oh yeah, well Jesus died, of course that's right. But man, we have we have communion. We think about things like the was talking about because Jesus died. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like Jesus, the God who everything was created for and through that we looked at earlier in Colossians. Jesus who sustains all of creation. Jesus who wants to reconcile, who died for us. He, he was an actual person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Paul writes here that he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. Why does he say physical body? Because we always need to be reminded that Jesus is a real human person. Yeah. He's fully God and, hu- and fully human. Remember Paul said earlier that uh, Jesus is, is, the, is the incarnate God. He's God in the flesh. Everything we could possibly know about God, we know through Jesus because he was a physical being. He still is a physical being now on a spiritual plane. His physical body. An actual person was put on an actual cross, was flipped, was beaten, was pierced at the end and died for us. And that's what Paul says. Hey, you were this, but you've been reconciled, not because of you deciding you wanted to change and not be bad, or you wanted to change and be more good. But Christians are re- reconciled through Christ's physical body, right. through death. Mm-hmm. And then it says we get to be presented holy in the sight of God without blemish and free from accusation here. But how are we presented holy? Jesus died for us. How do we get in that state where Jesus died? I want to I want to understand. I want to be free. I want to be in front of God without blemish and free from accusation. Right. I don't want to be God's enemy. How do we get into that state? How are we presented holy there? How do we get that level of reconciliation? I mean, if I want to get reconciled to my wife, I might buy a card and some flowers and say, honey, I am so sorry, and then enumerate all of the things I did wrong in a previous encounter. I, I, I recognize I did this and that, and that part was my fault. And then it, invariably my wife will apologize about something there, and we love each other again. There's also fresh flowers on the table. It's nice. But how do you reconcile with a holy and perfect God? You can't. That's Jesus. But how do we grab onto that and how do we get presented before God as if we had never ever sinned as if we never ever got drunk or or did drugs or we never gossiped we were never immoral in any way I think that's what everyone wants don't we all want to be clean to feel like I'm not I'm not dirty I'm, I'm not bad I'm not a blemish People don't like if people don't like me because I love God and I have a great relationship with God. That's all right. But a lot of times people don't like us because we're so blemished, we're so buggable. We have more information about this than the Colossians have. The Colossians are getting this letter, uh, and they've gotten some teaching not from Paul but from from his friend Epaphras who was there. We talked about that a little bit a couple weeks ago. Paul had never actually been to Colossae, and so they're getting this letter, and we have all of. Uh, all of Paul's letters that we have in the Bible, there's probably more letters by Paul. We have a lot more teaching about this. Later on in Colossians chapter 2, uh, it says this in verse 9, it says, In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Paul says that a second time. It's important. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In Him, you are also circumcised. That's this, for, for this meaning, it means made clean. You were circumcised. You were made presentable to God. In Him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. Not with a circumcision done by hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ. Jesus has made us clean. How do we get clean through Jesus? Verse 12, Having been buried with Him in baptism and raised with Him through your faith in the power of God who raised Him from the dead. How do we get reconciliation? Baptism. That's where we get cleansed. Not, not like you're, you're taking a bath, but it's a spiritual cleansing. Uh, Romans verse 6 says, uh, you actually die with him. Right. Uh, when I was baptized, John Smith died in the waters of baptism. And out popped J.C. Smith, a whole new being, a different person. Yeah. Different life, different goals, different vision, yeah. different devotions. <laughs> no longer alienated, but now fully a member clean 
unblemished in God's family. That's how we get reconciled. It says it over and over again. Colossians 2, Romans 6. There's other places you can find about being clean. The only way we can be reconciled to God is to die to ourselves and be raised again with Jesus. Amen. And that's through our faith. It happens at baptism through faith in Jesus. And then what happens? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Right. How can you be clean in front of God? How can you be unblemished? Get rid of yourself yeah. Yeah. and become a new creation. And that's what the Bible teaches reconciliation actually comes through. But is that the end? Man, I wish that was the end. Yeah. It would be so great in a spiritual sense. I'm not saying that anyone should die after this. But in a spiritual sense, it would be so great if I died after my baptism. If I physically died. Yeah. Because then I would have no more chance to be a sinful person, right? I have no more chance to tell people, man, it's really annoying when you crunch those chips. Well, everyone else is okay with it. I'm the weirdo. Man, that would have been so good. I would have never hurt anyone's feelings or, or had any sinful thoughts or sinful behaviors. But I go on with life, and what am I going to do? Are we, are we going to be perfect after we get baptized, until the time we die. We're more likely to be perfect if we die right after our baptism. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But until then, we have to continue. The third point is continuation. Yeah. Continuation. Colossians 1.23 says, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that... Am I right? Okay. And this is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. In verse 22, Paul says, If you continue in your faith... You wonder what that picture is? Yes, it's a mouse holding up from a mouse trap like this. It's one of my favorite videos. And in the video, the mouse is just bench pressing the mouse trap. He never gives up. Never gives up. Verse 22, Paul says, If you continue in your faith... Paul doesn't say that uh, you're absolutely going to go to heaven. Don't worry about anything. Paul says, hey, all these things are going to happen if you continue in your faith. Amen. Continuance, perseverance is incredibly important as a Christian. Paul talks about it many times. He talks about it for himself in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Paul says, I fought the good fight. He doesn't say I've lived the good life. He said, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And it's a race. It's a fight. It's time. It's effort yeah. to continue in the grace of God that comes through Christ Jesus. And then when does Paul wanted to get it? God really wants us to get this. So we have this from Paul. And then in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, God teaches us this. We've come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence that we had at first. So you can't just become a Christian and like, I'm good, I don't have to, I'm fine. I don't have to struggle against sin and all the good things. The longer you've been a Christian, the more you have to struggle. Yeah. Because you've been given more. It's not like I can be a Christian for 30 years and give less time right. and give less effort and give less money and give less of my heart. Right. The longer I've learned about the grace and the love that I have through the blood and the shedding of Jesus' blood at the cross, the more I'm confronted with my selfishness right. and my love of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. You can actually be more alienated 30 years on as a Christian yep. than you were 30 weeks on as a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. You can be more of an enemy of God 30 years later and still come to church than you were that moment after baptism. Wow. Yep. Yep. Perseverance. Perseverance doesn't mean keep coming to church till you die. That's right. You coming to church is just right. a symptom of you giving your life to God and the things of God. And the things that God loves. Mm -hmm. And saying, I'm not going to be a friend of the world. I'm gonna, wherever there's a meeting of the body and a time I can get together to impact brothers and sisters and other people, I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to hold firmly to the end 
the confidence I had at first. Man, such an important concept is yeah. continuance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Continuance. Look at those words in these three passages. If you continue in your faith, Paul says, man, I've fought the good fight. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we hold firmly till the end. Yeah. Continuance is so important. If that mouse ever stops pushing up, he's a dead mouse. If we ever stop striving, give our very best, we die all over again. Yep. Right. Yep. And how sad for us. Mm -hmm. How sad to be a Christian after 30, 40 years mm -hmm. and have less hope yeah. wow. than you had on the day after yeah. you were baptized. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Preach, yeah. Yeah. Have less confidence. If you hold firmly to the confidence. Yeah. I don't know if I can change. I don't know if I can do it. I'm afraid. Of course you can. And in 40 years, I hope all of you, I hope all of us, I hope I have more confidence than the first day mm -hmm. because of all yeah. that I see that God's done. Yeah. But you gotta, yeah. you got to continue. Yeah. read a story uh, from a Church of Christ minister. and uh, The guy's older now, but in the early 90s, he was about 60 years old, and him and his son and his daughter-in-law, they went to run a marathon. He was about 60 when he ran this marathon. And it, was, it was in Indiana. It was called the Sunburst Marathon, and... Uh, and it was June in Indiana. I can only imagine the pollen and there's no breeze in Indiana. I can't, like that just bothers There's plenty of breeze in Syracuse. That's nice on a marathon. But he's in Indiana. He's 60 years old. He's going to go and run 23 miles. He's run marathons before. And so he lived in Missouri and it's about 400 miles for him to get to South Bend, Indiana. And so he goes out and he's going to run. And he's running with his son and his daughter-in-law, and about mile marker 18, he, he says, I, I wasn't feeling very good. There was something going on with my hips. It was hurting worse than it normally hurt. And so I, he says, I stopped at mile marker 18, and I said, where's the pickup vehicle? Because when you run marathons, oftentimes there's a pickup vehicle at some of the later mile markers. And if you can't make it or you're injured or whatever, they'll pick you up and take you back to an aid station or whatever it is, and everything's going to be all right. So at mile marker 18, he's feeling it in his hips, and he's like, oh, I don't think I'm going to make it. Where's the pickup vehicle? And his son and daughter-in-law were about 25 years younger than him, and so they're like, what are you talking about? They had, they've never even thought of a pickup vehicle. <clears throat> and so the guy's like, all right, I, I guess I'm going to have to keep, keep running. And so he goes a couple more miles, the mile marker 20, and he's like, hey, wait, guys, let me ask the guys at the mile marker. Is there, like, where's the pickup van? Because I'm, I'm feeling terrible. I can't make it. And they're like, I, we don't ha I'm sorry, we don't have that. And so he goes a couple more miles. He gets to the 22-mile marker, and he's like, I, I just want to sit down, and I just want to stop. I want to drop out of the race because I'm so hot and tired, and my hips are killing me. He's like, this is terrible. Yeah. And at mile marker 22, that was his only choice. Either I'm going to sit here, and it's going to be miserable forever, or I run the next mile, and I get home. It, the only way I'm going to get home today is if I run this mile, and then I can just lay out and whatever, and tomorrow the kids can drive me home. So he just he kept going, and he ran, and he finished the race. And he found out after the race that he actually came in third for his age division. He had never even placed before in a marathon that he'd run in. There's something good about being 60 if you keep running a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> but the thought that got him through was, man, if I'm going to get home, I've got to finish this race. He would never have placed third in an A division and had this great victory if he had given up. But the important part there is, he said to himself, if I'm going to get home, I've got to finish the race. Yep. Yeah. I wonder if that applies to the Christian life. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I'm going to get home, if I'm going to get to heaven, I've got to finish the race. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like youth sports now where everyone gets a medal. It used to be that only the first place, second, third place, that's when you get the medal. Yeah. Now you sign up, you get the medal before you even start the marathon. It's amazing. If we want to get the crown, we've got to finish the race. We have to continue. Never, ever quit. Amen. The Bible doesn't teach that you'll never get tired, that it'll never be hard, that it'll never be difficult. It says finish the race. Yeah, right. It says if you hold firmly. Yeah. It says if you keep going. 
The only options are you keep going and you get home, or you stop and you don't. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're a Christian, no one expects you to have a perfect life. Yeah. But everyone expects us to get up and keep going because of God's grace. Mm -hmm. Because of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. We can keep going. We can be reconciled to riches if we keep going, if we continue. Mm -hmm. We can't give up because the best is yet to come. You know, you run a race and you want to get the prize, right? Yeah. The last point is glorification. That's the last thing we say here. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 22 says this about the prize. Now he's reconciled us. So God has reconciled us to Christ's physical body through death. But here's the reason. To present us holy in his sight without blame, uh, blemish and free from accusation. This is how we appear before God. He's so happy to see us. We're in white robes. We go to heaven and we get to see. We're presented to God holy and blameless. Some people think to themselves, well, is that, I don't know, that's, you don't know which ethnicity that Jesus is right there. You can't see from where you are. It's kind of mixed there. <laughs> Some people are like, well, that's Jesus. Is that, well, Jesus is God. So if you go and you're presented to Jesus, you're presented to God. I, I, I imagine in my mind that I go to heaven and I'm presented to God. And he looks just like Jesus because Jesus is God. And then I finally get to know, oh, wow, this is what Jesus looked like. He was about my height. Um, <laughs> we, we get to be presented not just, not just in heaven to God but we look perfect yeah. your teeth are perfect your eyes are perfect your ears are perfect your height is perfect everything about you is perfect before God Amen. it sounds difficult to grasp isn't it? like we have we can't imagine that. We have our, everyone has their flaw in their body that they see. Maybe your nose is too small for your face, considering how wide apart your eyes are. Or maybe, uh, maybe you're too short, maybe you're too tall, maybe you're too skinny, maybe you're too round. Every single person has something about their body that they hate. More people have something about their personality, their character, their sin, yep. that they hate. We don't think it can happen. But the Bible teaches that it can, if we're reconciled and we continue with Jesus, we will be glorified. You know, everyone loves an idea of that, of, of rags to riches, of glorification. My wife likes to watch um, uh, this show, The Voice, and she's left. Does anybody here watch The Voice? Uh, a couple people do. So there's, a, uh, there's a, a, a judge on The Voice right now. Her name is Kelly, and I blanked on her last name. What's her name? Clarkson. Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson. That's right. Which is kind of, it's kind of wild because Kelly Clarkson, remember, was like the first winner of American Idol. Yeah, so she right. was on another voice thing, and she came in first place. And she's got some cool songs, and, and people like her. She's kind of goofy, if you ask me, but, I, but maybe that's what people like. The good entertainers are goofy, right? So, so she likes this. Last season on The Voice, they had Jennifer Hudson. Yeah. Right. J-Hud Productions, if you watch The Voice. My wife <laughs> loves The Voice. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because Jennifer Hudson was also on American Idol. Do you know where she finished in American Idol? Seventh place. When she was 25 years old, she finished seventh place. She cut up to the top 12, and she was the last person cut before they went on to the next six. She got seventh place. But she kept going. So that was in April of 04, she got cut. In November of 2005, she got this role of a, a woman named Effie White in the show Dream Girls on Broadway. Come on, come on. And that show was originally, uh, Jennifer Holliday was the original role of Effie White in that show. And, uh, and it was a great hit. I mean, it was incredibly, incredibly popular. That was in May of 05. In February of 2005, she won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for her role in the same film, Dream Girls. At 25 years old, she was the eighth youngest winner of the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. Wow. Yeah. And she was only the third African-American woman to win Best Supporting Actress Oscar. During her acceptance speech, she said, I just want to take a moment. I can't believe this. Look at what God can do. I didn't think I was going to win. From being cut seventh place to being the third African-American woman to winning Best Supporting Actress. 
I mean, you would think just seventh place on the idol would be amazing. But when you keep going, how much more can you get if you just keep working, if you just keep at it, if you just keep going? If that's true of Jennifer Hudson, how much true of us is that with God? You might, fall, you might get seventh place. This might not be your year. But you keep going. You got to continue. Because God wants to see you. God wants you in his presence. He wants you to be without a blemish, without a mark. God wants you to have the best life for eternity, not for here. We got to continue as Christians. Psalm chapter 84 verse 10 says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. How challenging is it to get someone to hold the door open for you? The psalmist says, if I could just do that in heaven, that would be the absolute best place ever. Because I would be, without blemish, standing before God. I'm going to close out with this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. We can be reconciled to riches. We've got to take responsibility for our alienation. We can have reconciliation, but we also have to have continuation. If we want to have glorification, and this verse sums it all up, we follow Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you that we can read in your Bible and we know in our lives that we were sinners, that we are sinners. The only difference is now we've been reconciled to you through Jesus. I pray, Father, that you help us to put our confidence in him. Help us to love you and not the world, to do more good things and less evil behavior. Help us to continue with that mindset for the rest of our lives on earth so we can have the glorification that you promise all throughout your scripture, so that we can be before you, holy and blameless, without blemish in your sight. We can have so much more than we ask for or imagine in this earth, and we can have it for eternity if we'll continue with the confidence that we had at first. We love you guys. We pray you'll help us to have the strength to persevere and to continue. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You are dismissed. Have a great time of fellowship.